Duct sealing and testing. The duct sealing procedure can be divided into two portions, repairing large leaks found during the general inspection and then finding and repairing additional leaks that show up as a result of repairing those large leaks. The thing we do when we go and study a job is we look for a history of leaks. Here we've got a history of leaks at, uh, you can see the dirt coming out and I'm willing to bet that once we seal those leaks that we're going to have other leaks because that duct job, that, that tape that's just wrapped around there is just really not going to hold air once we fix the bigger leaks below. Here's a transition that somebody did very skillfully and uh, it has some gaps in it, it looks like, uh, not too tight. So somebody wrapped it with some fiberglass tape and put some mastic on it and sealed it up and now it's working. Well, what the heck is fiberglass tape? Well, I'm glad you asked. Fiberglass tape, you put some mastic on the duct to give it a place to stick to, and then you wrap the duct with the fiberglass tape. When you wrap it all, you make sure that it's good and sealed and push down, and you let that layer dry, or if you're like me and you're just impatient, then you move on and you put the next layer on, and it looks really thick on there. In fact, it's it's pretty thick on this. Now this particular type of mastic is flexible. It remains flexible. So as a duct flexes and moves, it'll, it'll stay flexible. And so I know it lasts over 25 years because some that I put on is still there and it's still flexing and it's still working and it didn't crack. Uh, other areas I've seen it crack if it dries out. If you have a harder, there's, there's some mastics that are hard and those you want to put on very thin. You want to follow the manufacturer's direction for whatever type of mastic you're using and that's important to know whether they want it to put on very thin or whether you could just booge it on there thick like this stuff. Well, the technique that you use probably depends on what kind of duct you're repairing. Now, if you're, if you're building duct board, you see up here on the top left, you see like a tool and that's made for cutting the duct board so it folds together and seams and there's different ki types of cuts for different types of joints. And then you usually will put down some tape and uh, you got to use something to rub that tape with to make sure it sticks. And when we were doing it, then we would staple the tape and put another coat of tape over it. But the staple for a duct board has to have a, a, a special kind of staple that curves outward or else it won't hold. If you put a regular staple in duct board, it's just going to pull right out. You're wasting your time. Now it's recommended that you seal the inside of supply ducts and especially like this floor register where it's coming through, it's all sealed up from the inside and you can see. Now that doesn't mean cover the whole entire opening with mastic like I've seen pictures of in nightmare scenarios. Uh, how you apply the duct, this is an example, it's two pictures out of a series of a dozen pictures on how you do it. It's showing a, down at the bottom left, you're showing the duct and you're still showing some flex and then you got the flex, you put some mastic on the duct and you pull the flex up over that mastic and then you tighten it down with the clamp and then you've got to pull the insulation over the whole thing and then clamp it down and then you've got to seal the end of the insulation too if you're in a humid or moist climate. Once the disconnected duct and the large holes have been repaired and sealed, the decision must be made on what to do about the smaller leaks. There are three possibilities. Ignore them, seal them by hand, and use an internal aerosol sealing system. So any one of those three possibilities you can do. Well, as the leaks get smaller, we're going to need to test the duct. It's a good idea to test in and test out. So, you know, if you have ducts and they're leaking like a sieve, there's, I mean, if they're disconnected and there's giant holes, there's no point in hooking up a piece of equipment like this. It's just a huge, horrible leak, unless you want to show 50% improvement by doing very little. And uh, I wouldn't recommend that, but at any time you want to take a, a measurement of the airflow going uh, out of a duct system, you need to put an airflow in. And to do that, you need to seal up all the registers and grills, and then you take a calibrated fan like this, and you can measure the airflow, and then you can look for leaks. One way to look for leaks is to use a smoke test where you put smoke into the calibrated fan and smoke the whole duct system. If you have big enough leaks, you'll smoke the whole house and set off the fire alarms. So that's not the way I generally do it. What I generally do is I use a little squeeze bulb and I have these tubes and they're chemical smoke and I break the tube and I go around with a squeeze bulb and I squeeze it and smoke comes out wherever I need it and then I can see which way the air is going and I can mark where holes and leaks are when they're small enough. If they're too big you can't follow them with smoke because they'll just blow the smoke away immediately but if they're that big you should be able to feel it with your hand. Well, what do you mean you uh, break the tube? Well, I don't actually break the tube. Uh, I think you're right. You're making fun of me now. Uh, I, uh, there's glass inside the tube, and it's got the two chemicals in it to make the smoke. And you bend the tube, and the glass breaks, and then they mix. And when you squeeze the bulb, it squeezes air through the tube, and that makes the smoke come out. So 
it's it's really not breaking the tube. I'm, you're right. I misspoke. Another thing that's done often in home performance is they use a blower door and then they use a pressure pan and they'll chart the pressure drops at different diffusers and then they'll say okay well based on this pressure difference here we have leaks and they have charts and ways of doing that if you really want to impress your friends and acquaintances you can become familiar with the requirements in ANSI ACCA 5 QI 2015 HVAC quality installation specification that's where the minimum requirements for duct leakage and duct testing are listed you can get one for free at www.acca.org slash quality to save you time I thought I would list them right here and now for new construction test using any one of the three options ducts 100% located in a thermal envelope have no more than 10% total duct leakage and airflow in CFM. Ducts in any portion located outside of the thermal envelope have no more than 6% total duct leakage and airflow CFM or per local code or authority having jurisdiction. Well, before the little voice jumps in and jumps me about existing construction, you know, what about existing construction? I can hear him now in my head. Uh, well, we're going to look at existing construction. And uh, this is in Section 5.1.1 of the standard. And it says, no more than 20% total duct leakage, airflow and CFM, or 50% improvement, or the 20%, which is above, which is 5.1.1.B.I. 5 5 5 That's a lot of stuff to say. And so, if you wanted to really jump around and pat yourself on the back and say, hey, I got 50% improvement, somebody could just leave the ducts disconnected, even though they saw them disconnected, and do the fan test and then hook them up and say, hey, I have 50% improvement. I've done a quality installation. Well, I think you're cheating, and it's really not what we want to do for quality installation. We want to, you know, even a quality repair, we want to try and fix it, you know, at least to, to get the best we can. And so, you know, go for that 20% duct leakage, or if, if you don't have pan joists or, you know, you know, they're not using wall cavities. You can do better than that on most existing systems. But some of it, you, obviously, you can't reach. That's why we got these bigger allowances for existing because it's in a wall. Nobody wants you to tear out the wall. However, I guess you could use some of those spray type units to spray inside and seal them from the inside out and get very close to uh, new construction standards. And then the third choice on here is per local code or authority having jurisdiction insulating a duct system. I guess the bottom line here is most insulation and most duct insulation will have the insulation value on it. If it doesn't have the value on it, a good rule of thumb would be don't use it because you need to buy something that has an R value to know what the R value is. Also, if you're looking at older stuff that's there, you can look for those R values on it. Sometimes you can't find the R value because it's the insulation's inside the duct in which case you could uh, drill a hole in a duct and then measure how thick the insulation is and try to figure out based on the type it is um, what the R value is and then duct wrap it's got the insulation value on it always so you can see it it's on the outside here's some pictures of duct that I got out in the field and well, you can see the R values on them uh, go figure the duct board has an R value of 4.3 and the flex has an R value of 4.2 so I could then compare those R values to the current R values required and decide whether or not I wanted to add insulation or not let's imagine that we're gonna look at our our four insulations that we just saw and and I'm in Virginia and Virginia's in that middle column and I've got a, a gas oil or heat pump and over here it's an unconditioned attic let's say it says R4 through R8 so I'm barely there I've got R4 so I'm meeting a requirement that is reckon, recommended by the EPA however R8 is probably closer to what the new code is and you can check the new code for your area and I might want to consider upgrading that to an R8 at a minimum, I've got to upgrade to what the local code requirement is when I'm doing duct upgrades or new installations. So for new installations, you know, I don't get to use this chart to, as an option. I've got to do what the code requires. And uh, when I do upgrades, it's always smart to go with what the latest energy requirements are because that's where you're going to get your bang for your buck on your energy savings. 
This is a little bit confusing, and I'm going to explain it so it's less confusing, hopefully. Zone 1 Pascals are hooked up to the meter in the one static probe on the left. Zone 2 Pascals are hooked up to the other side of the probe. So one's on the positive port, one's on the negative port. And so the manometer itself is adding them together. And when the manometer adds them together, if the difference is, gr is less than or equal to 3 pascals, then we don't have to make any adjustment because there's not that much of a pressure difference. And we discussed in earlier uh, sequences what happens and what causes pressure in differences. It can be caused by too much supply or not enough return, or it can be caused by other problems. Well, here we're showing you what you might want to do if you find that you have too big of a pressure differential between a bedroom and a hall, for instance, where the main returns in the hall and the bedroom door is shut. You can put a jump duct or you can change and install returns and put return ducts in there. And so there's different ways to get the difference in uh, Pascal's down and to have the zones balance out and corrected properly. Lessons learned. You should now be able to explain several duct leakage test methods. You should be able to explain the difference between pressures and rooms and what the maximum amount should be. Less than or equal to 3 pascals. Cheat. You should now be able to explain why you may want to recommend a duct leakage test prior to starting a duct repair and upon completion of the duct repair. And you should be able to locate existing duct R values and compare them to the current requirements.